My name is uh, Don Smith, and I'm with the Smith Family Foundation. Um, uh, we at the foundation really believe in the power of ideas and uh, free debate, and that's what we think makes America great, and that all sides should be heard. My position on the proposition before us this evening, did the communists do more harm than good, is quite simple. They, did, they not only didn't do more harm than good, they did more good than harm. And I have four reasons for that. The first reason is the, is the obvious one. It's the movies that they wrote. This is the caliber and the morality of these communists. They were not in favor of democracy. They were out and out Stalinists who wanted a Soviet system in this country, and they were defending, as I said, every twist and turn of the party line. They were not fighting for American democracy. Pornography, the Mises report explained, leads to sexual violence, rape, deviation, and the destruction of families. One of the arguments against porn, you know, is always these negative social effects, and, and Pamela's book is certainly uh, filled with those. But let's, you know, it's one thing if you talk to people who, uh, who consume porn for eight hours a day or six hours a day or 30 seconds a day or whatever. I mean, people who are porn addicts or regular users. If you pull back from that, and those people often, you know, are, are any people here porn addicts, by the way? This, this, is a, this is as good a place to come out as you can. The reason, one of the things that we track is something that we call cultural proliferation, which is the idea that, you know, there's just more ability. Everybody has more ability to create and consume culture that they want in more and more increasing ways. And this is incredibly liberating, and there are always dark sides to all of this type of stuff. But the same kind of trends, the same techno technological trends, the same social trends that allow for more expression of more ideas, uh, to kind of live in a John Stuart Mill, a world of uh, experiments and living. It also allows us to control things more. Um, this is one of the things, I'm a parent, I've got a 12-year-old boy and a 4-year-old boy. Uh, they have access to media, to art, to culture, to images, you know, it, just in a way when I was a kid, and, you know, I, I didn't have anything like that. And my, uh, my choices were so much greater than my parents who had grown up in the Depression. Um, but the same technology that allows us, gets us all of that stuff, also allows us to control things. And it's, I, I'm not pretending that I have some kind of authoritarian panopticon control of my kids, but I can do a lot, and I actually, it's, it's pretty easy. And this is also gets to the point of individual responsibility and living in a free society. If we want to live in a free society and an open society, the point is not to enforce a single view of morality. The point is to come up with a social system that allows people who have different ideas of morality to coexist peacefully. And that means free expression, and it means things like the First Amendment, and broadening the ability of people with different visions of the good life or the good society to get along with minimal harm. And that's one of the reasons why I think we need to be careful when we start talking about pornography, because pretty soon then you're talking about political speech, like the McCain-Feingold bill or whatever. I mean, there are forces of repression in this, in this country that want to stop expression. And it's better to talk about expression, I think, than uh, simply speech or art or anything like that. To look for Islamic terrorists randomly, I think, is uh, a deliberately stupid policy. I do not think that uh, there should be targeting based on apparent Muslim identity. I think I agree with David that it should be behavioral based, but I think that officers should be given the discretion to take into account somebody's apparent uh, national identity in determining whether behavior is suspicious. Science says we must do this. And so this is why, unfortunately, I would conclude that science is forever politicized. But I think there's, there's hope for how, again, I think the, the process of liberal science that I was describing is the way out. The basis of this politicization is that the federal government spends $132 billion a year on research and development. And this is money that, of course, the Congress, that everybody in, who works for the government and all the citizens will have some interest in seeing it distributed. This immediately implies politics. There's no getting around that. So here we have a series of questions which um, um, in most of the legal world today are considered to be um, fairly well settled. And then we have certain people out there who I might refer to as troublemakers uh, who come along and say, uh, you know, 
uh, maybe the answers that we've come to today aren't really the right answers, and we should look at the answers given previously and see if they might have made more sense. So high in the troublemaking category, I would put uh, Professor Richard Epstein. I think, in fact, the way we understand that the progressives clearly had to have been wrong about the commerce power is that if they were right, Marshall wrote an opinion which allowed Congress to abolish slavery, because that would certainly affect commerce amongst the several states. There was nobody previous to 1861 who thought you could get rid of that deplorable institution by congressional action. The Commerce Clause was very well understood to be much narrow, and it held that meeting all the way through the 18th Amendment on Prohibition. Simplest proposition is, it's very easy to put these programs in place. If you get a single lapse in judgment by the Supreme Court, you get a major Social Security program. Once it's there, there's absolutely nothing that you can do to disentangle it. And the reason you don't want the federal government to get in these areas, at least if you thought about this clearly in 1935, is they could never keep their promises. They couldn't prevent these programs from becoming monsters that would destroy everything in their path. Something happened to the environment, to the financial environment in the early part of the century. Some new developments must have happened to cause the subprime mortgage boom and bust to take place when it did. How did the rates get so low? They went down from 6.5% at the end of 2000 to just 1% in the middle of 2003, where they stayed for a full year, and then they only very gradually came up. Global warming is real. It's happening. It's certainly something we should take seriously. However, and let me move on to the second point, it's often vastly exaggerated and often very one-sidedly explained, and I would argue that gives reason for us to make bad decisions, essentially because we get scared, we get panicked, and we make bad decisions. It worries me greatly when we look at the issues that black America faces and are told by very well-intentioned people and very intelligent people that black America's main task, what we are to study the hardest, what we are to think about the most, what we are to explore in our novels, what we are to be is exploring the nature of and the prevalence of racism. Now, the point is not that there isn't any, and one could go on and on about racism. I have in my books. It's not that it doesn't exist. However, I think that we're taught to stress it to such an extent that black people who need help don't get as much of it as they could. And what I mean is in a couple of cases that one encounters all the time, which I'll just very briefly mention, to kind of set the stage. It is accepted as a kind of unquestioned wisdom that the problem with the inner city schools that don't teach children that we hear so much about is money. There isn't enough money in these schools. There is much money in Scarsdale, not enough in the Bronx for these schools. And that the reason that the children are not learning and that the schools are in the condition that they are is because the fat cats in Washington or in the State House won't give these poor schools the money that they need to do well. This is put most succinctly across in Jonathan Kozel's book, Savage Inequalities. The fact is that as plausible as that sounds, when you actually look at how school funding works across the United States, and you look at countless cases of suburb versus city, you find that the idea that the problem is as simple as funding, which of course translates into racism, simply isn't true. And I don't mean that it's a matter of opinion. I don't mean that it's a matter of jiggering the statistics. I mean that the idea that if we gave these unfortunate schools the kind of money that people talk about would solve the problem, it wouldn't. And yet, you can read an editorial page of a newspaper pretty much every week where that idea is assumed. I'm reading the galley of a book called Welcome to the Terror Dome right now. It's about racism in sports. Twice the author has flagged this savage inequalities point. It's typical. But for example, in New Jersey, starting in the 1990s, schools in Newark and Jersey City and Camden, 
these hideous schools that we hear about, that something certainly must be done about, were actually given exactly the kind of money that schools in leafy suburbs get. In fact, they actually started getting more per student. It's been a long, sad story, what happened after that decision, but suffice it to say that the schools in question are still terrible. You know, we really like to see a full house, and that's what we have tonight.